Welcome back to Radical Engagements. And today we continue talking about Feng Shao Han's big data section and psychopolitics. And we're on the subsection, the quantified self. Um, he did this whole thing about the, libid uh, the libidinal energy of the quantified self. I think I call it the quantified self. But anyway, um, so... I will just admit, go back and listen to the first episode on this. I'm getting very frustrated with Han's use of hypostatization, a tribing agency to abstractions and not explaining how those abstractions are actually built or what they represent. And his uh, tendency to build schemas and then give schemas causal relationships without, you know, talking about what they refer. And basically a substitution um where this seems to be doing more than it does because a lot of people actually work out how this might work in their response to it um and there's a lot of rhetoric here that is masquerading at the as theory the quantified self belief that life admits measurement and quantification doubles the digital age as a whole give me an example of that the quantified self honors this faith too the body is outfitted with sensors that automatically register data. Asterisk, this is Han's problem with Fitbit. Measurements of all temperature, blood sugar levels, calorie intake and use, movement profiles, and fat content. The heart rate is taken out of state of, of meditation. Performance and efficiency still count with relaxing. Moods, dispositions, and routine activities are all inventoried as well. Such self-measurements and self-monitoring are supposed to enhance the mental performance. Yet, the mounting pile of data this yields does nothing to answer the simple question, who am I? Quantified self represents the Dadaist technology, too. This is him stacking up metaphors and using the metaphors he stacked as explanations. How does this impress people? Seriously. Anyway. It empties out the self of all of any and all meaning. How? How does quantification empty out the self of all meaning? Quantification is meaningful. I'm not saying that it's good. I'm not saying that this is the right thing to do. I'm not saying that other subjective or uh, uh, interpersonal or intersubjective states are important. I'm just saying it's not empty of content. Anyway, the self gets broken down into data until no sense remains. No sense of what? Also, there's a play here between self and person and body that's a little weird. Um, this is just assumed that the three things are the same. And it requires you to realize that, to hold that belief for this to make any sense. Anyway, as you guys can tell as we go through this, I'm getting more and more annoyed with Han. The motto of the quantified self is self-knowledge through numbers. The motto of an abstraction is whatever I say it is. But no insight into the self can result from data and numbers alone, no matter how exhaustive they are. Yeah, you have to have context for the data. You need qualia for the data. You need, uh, yes, I mean, I agree with that. Numbers do not recount anything about the self. Counting is not recounting. That's a pun, but fair enough, true. A sense of self derives from giving an account. Account can mean a lot of things, buddy. It is not counting, but recounting that leads to self-discovery or self-knowledge. As in recursive reflection, sure, but you can take the data as part of that. It's only part of it, right? You have Yes, you have to contextualize any data. Big whoop. Even the people who generate this stuff know this. This is like, a, this is a, this is like not even a straw man. In antiquity, the care of the self was tied to practices of self-observation. Publicatio su tutorialian. Oh, it, so you're going to go to a to a Donatist heretic as an example of antique thought? Okay. Represents a significant component of paying due attention in this matter. Quote, writing is also important in culture, taking care of oneself. One of the main features of taking care involved taking notes of oneself to reread writing treatises and letters to friends to help them and keeping notebooks in order to reactivate for oneself the truths one needed. 
uh, Foucault Technologies on the Self, page 25. So I will note that he builds this up as if he's talking about Tertullian, but he cites Foucault. And I, I'm guessing he's citing Foucault's technology of the self to talk about the self in the, in the antique world. But every time I go for a primary source in here, it's a secondary source, or he's citing an, uh, an antique author through the lens of a modern theorist. Um, very rarely are we getting anything direct. That's also questionable. Publicatio, uh, Publicatio Su meant committing to the search for the truth. Yeah, but I mean, you're again, you're using a non-standard thinker as your. You could go to a bunch of different places for for what the the, the complexities of this an antique Greek and Roman thought, or early Christian thought, but you've all kind of just papered over as one thing too. That's not unique to Han, but I I hate when people do that. All right. Records of one's life served an ethic of an ethics of the self. In contrast, dataism self-tracking is devoid of all ethics and truth. Yeah, the data tracking itself would not have ethics and truth in their own context. Sure, it's how one uses them. This is all Martin Bailey shit, Han. Every bit of it. Anyway, it amounts to simply to a technology for self-monitoring. Yes, that's what it is. You have to contextualize it. When the data collected is published and exchanged, self-tracking comes to resemble self-surveillance more and more. Because that's what it is. The subject of today's world is the entrepreneur of the self practicing self-exploitation. Do you make money off of it? Then you're not an if you don't, you're not an entrepreneur. Sorry. And by the same token, self-surveillance. The auto-exploiting subject creates around its own labor camp here. Here it is perpetuator and victim at one and the same time. As self-illuminating, self-surveilling subject, it bears its own in internal panopticon within. Here there is no difference between guard and inmate. The digitized network is subject to the panopticon of itself. It ensures each and every person is now taken on the task of conducting perpetual auto-surveillance. Does it ensure each and every person does that since, you know, you can opt out? Otherwise, I mean, th this is this is conceptually fair, but very frustrating. It, it, there's a Martin Bailey here. There's a simple way to read this in which this is true, and there's a more complicated way to read this, which is the one that's sexier in which this is false. And, I mean, this is super common to all theory these days, but it, it's really bad. In, in this book. Life logged in full today. The clicks we make and the search words we type are stored. Yeah, true. Every step is watched and recorded. Fair enough. A complete picture of our lives exists on the internet. I'm not sure. Only if you give the, that information. Our digital habitats provide an extremely precise likeness of our person, of our very souls. I, I would like to push back on that. Like I've said, it, it is getting more and more precise, but how precise it is is still up for debate. I mean, weirdly, one of the things I'm learning about Han is he's a techno-pessimist who's also a techno-optimist. He takes these technologies at face value. Like they can do what they're being sold to us as being able to do. Perhaps it is even fully more accurate than the images we otherwise make of ourselves. So I'll say, what the algorithm knows is what we tell it we we think we are, not necessarily what we are. The number of web addresses now available are practically unlimited. As such, any item of use can be given its own internet address. Objects themselves are starting to transmit information. They report on our lives, activities, and habits, the expansion of Web 2.0 to the Internet of Persons to Web 3.0, the Internet of Things, is bringing digital control society to completion. Web 3.0 has made it possible to log every aspect of our life. Eh, not quite. Although it is, I will admit, this is this this is getting closer, which is why I don't have smart a bunch of stuff in my house. <laughs> now the very things we use every day are surveilling us. They kind of always were, though. I'm just saying, it's not, anyway, yes, more so than the past, but 
People have always been collecting data of this stuff if they could. We are caught, so to speak, in the total memory of the digital. It's not total memory, though. Digital stuff fades all the time. It's fairly ephemeral. It's part of the problem with it. Anyway, Bentham's Panopticon still lacked an efficient recording system. It only had a punishment long for penalties enacted and reasons they occurred. Prisoners' actual lives were not taken down. Big Brother had no way of knowing what the inmates really thought or desired. In contrast to Big Brother, who can be quite forgetful, Big Data never forgets anything at all. That's not true. There's data, like stuff disappears from the internet all the time. For this reason alone, the digital panopticon is much more offensive than Bentham's. I mean, yeah, but it's not as efficient as you're saying. Indeed, in the U.S. elections, de big data and data mining have proven to be the Columbus's eggs. Candidates can obtain a 360-degree view of their voters. Enormous masses of data are gathered from various sources, bought, in fact, and are connected to each other in ways that are highly precise voter profiles can result. In the process, clients can also gain insights into voters' private lives and their very psyche. Through micro-targeting, personalized messages are devised to address and influence voters. As practical microphysics of power, micro-targeting is data-driven psychopolitics. Likewise, intelligent algorithms make it impossible to predict, make it possible to predict voting behavior and optimize candidates' appeal. So far, that's not working. Again, uh, this is all true, and I think liberals were talking about this when when Han was writing this. I believe when this is book from. 2017, and he was clearly writing it 2013, 14, 15. Um, he was leading up to the Trump election when all this stuff was like the, you know, the 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 constant chatter of the day. Um, but this reminds me of people overassuming this about television in the 1980s that television was going to be able to control. Uh, market demographics. People were worried about this in the 1960s with the oncoming of televised debates. Like, none of this is new. And while it does get more precise, like, to make this argument, you really would need to do a history of the 20th century and spell this out, you know, in ways instead of just throwing out these kind of rhetorically laden, hypostaticized uh, theoretical paragraphs. More and more voting and buying, the state and the market, citizens and consumers are, are coming to resemble each other. It's been true since we've had political ads. Again, nothing new here. Micro-targeting has become the standard practice of psychopolitics. It's been the standard practice of psychopolitics. It was the standard practice of psychopolitics where DeBoer wrote Society of Spectacle in the 60s. Now is when television was crude and new. The census, which represents a biological practice of disciplinary society, provides material that may be used for the demographical, but but not psychological. Biopolitics is enabling and of, of enabling the subtle interventions in the is incapable of it, of enabling subtle individuals in the society. Why? I mean, why is X abstraction unable to do Y extraction? Um, because by I mean, obviously your brain would be biological. Why can't it intervene in the in the psyche? What weird dualism do you have to believe for this to be true, Han? There's all kinds of hidden assumptions in this as well. In contrast, digital psychopolitics manages to intervene in a psychic process in a, pr in a prospective fashion. Quite possibly, it's even faster than free will. What, we, okay, we're not, now we brought free will into it. Okay, so this is faster than free will. Like, look, the... the the number of of philosophical assumptions that one just has to accept for this to even be a meaningful argument is kind of exponentially expanding. As such, it could never overtake it. If so, the, this would herald the end of freedom. Victor Meyer, Schoenberger, and Kenneth Cochier, big data revolution that will transform the way we live, how and think. Um, that's in the end of freedom thing, but I don't see how that relates. Like, there's no quote there. The digital unconscious. Digital stuff is unconscious anyway, so it would always be unconscious. Anyway, I'm, I'm getting hostile with this text. It is possible that big data can even read desires we do not know we harbor. 
yeah, because it can read implications. But it's how accurate it is is a whole other question. And how would you even know? Again, Han's fear projection here is actually weirdly taking this this stuff on face value. After all, certain circumstances, we develop inclinations that elude consciousness. Often, we do not even know why suddenly experience a certain need. For instance, a given stage of pregnancy, a woman may crave a particular product, yet the impulse marks a correlation in which she remains unaware. We have some conscious in implications that can be understood by aggregate action. whoop de doo Again, not new. Talk, people were talking about this in the 50s. She buys the item. She doesn't know why. That's how it is. Conceivably, this that's how it is. S is so. This is all hyphenated. Exist in a psychic proximity to the Freudian id, the S. Uh, I see why they left the German in there, because in German, this makes more sense. Which escapes the ego and the consciousness. Okay, so Han assumes psychoanalysis is true. Got it. In this light, big data is making the ego, the iod into an ego to be exploited psychopolitically. It wasn't the aim of advertising always, if we assume this is true. If big data has access to the realm of our unconscious actions and inclinations, it is possible to construct a psychopolitics which would reach deep into our psyche to exploit it. According to Walter Benjamin, the the movie camera affords access to the optical unconsciousness. And this is a long quote from the work of art in the age of technological reproducibility, or as it's called also the work of art in the age of, me of mechanical reproduction. Both, I've, I've seen it translated to both things. Anyway, back to this long quote from Ben Hameen, Benjamin. With the close-up, space expands. With slow motion, movement is extended. Clearly, it is another nature which speaks to the camera as compared to the eye. The other, above all, is in a sense that a space is informed by human consciousness gets way to a space informed by unconsciousness. We are familiar with the movement of picking up a cigarette lighter or a spoon, but we know almost nothing of what really goes on between the hand and the metal, and still less of how it varies with different moods. This is where the camera comes into play. With all its resources for swooping and rising, disrupting and isolating, stretching and compressing a sequence, enlarging or reducing an object. It is though the camera we first discover the optical unconsciousness, we discover the instinctual unconsciousness through psychoanalysis. I just want to show you that ironically, in quoting this by Benjamin, Han is actually showing us the difference between good theory and whatever he's doing. Because while you could critique Benjamin, he does give you the mechanism and the difference in the act here versus just asserting abstract as abstract because abstract. One may understand big data and analogy to the Moomer camera. All oh, this is an analogy, buddy. Mr. Hahn. As a digital magnifying glass, data mining will enlarge the picture of human actions, except it doesn't show it to you in the same way. It's aggregated data, whereas the camera is able to actually focus in on movements that you are generally not aware of, even though you do them. Those aren't the same things. And I guess you realize that because you say it's an analogy, but then you don't really explain why it's an analogy and not just the same thing. Behind the framework of consciousness, it would then disclose another scene shot through the unconscious elements. Except it's not shot through the unconscious elements, it's aggregated. Again, this is a this is a argument based on a bad analogy. God, I would tear up freshman essays for doing this. Big data's microphysics then would enable actions to be made visible, that is, micro actions that elude detection by the waking mind. They're micro actions that are made visible by aggregation, if that aggregation is accurate. Han. Thus, big data also brings to light the collective patterns of behavior of which individuals are unaware and which would render the collective unconsciousness acceptable. It is an analogy to the optical unconsciousness. You just said that it was an analogy list twice. One could call the microphysical or microphysical web of relations the digital unconsciousness. 
as such, digital psychopolitics would be in a position to take control of mass behavior on a level that escapes detection. It wouldn't escape detection because the aggregation has to be there. I mean, yes, uh, Facebook literally attempted this and it kind of didn't work exactly. So, you know, uh, what's funny is this just, just so far, this is a mystification of the talking points of eight to five years ago, in the beginning of the Trump administration. This is just a more mystified rhetorical way of talking about what was already in the liberal press about like, Cambridge Analytica and whatnot. And given that the, the citations in this are like a weird mixture of uh, antique stuff, but as understood through other theorists, not going to the direct sources and like David Brooks, I don't know why this was, this book was so valorized. All right. I want to take time in this essay because it makes me mad and I can only do it in chunks. But also I have to comment on like every line. Um, we have one more session, and then we'll finish this up. Have a great day.